Right. After that, uh, fun and games. Um, I think you probably all know who I am, Will Godfrey, otherwise known as uh, uh, the Yoshimi Man or various other uh, insults or whatever. Um, what I want to do is go through some of the features that uh, Yoshimi has developed over the last uh, few years, which may not be entirely obvious. Um, and some might not appear terribly useful. Some you might think, oh, I wish we had that or whatever. Um, but anyway, first of all, um, one of the things we did quite a long time ago and we slowly progressed with is um, this uh, start menu. We've, we've Originally, there used to be a dirty great long menu that had all sorts of totally unrelated items on it. Um, you'll now see we've only got a very short menu and they're all basically system type control items. The next one along, uh, which also used to have partial entries on there, is now purely instruments and it, you show what the stored ones are, load and save and clear, all related directly to instruments. The next one, very similar format, is patch sets, which in uh, previously used to be referred to as parameters. Well, we thought patch sets made much more sense because it referred to what they really were rather than such a generic term. And again, we've got show, load, save, and also now recent sets. So the last ones that you used, lo and behold, you can show them there and you can click on them and get, them, get to them straight away. Following the same theme, we've got paths, the bank root directories, which used to be part of um, the settings, is now got its own little section there. Uh, and again, you've got preset directories, um, which any presets that you might generate through copy and paste, um, the locations where, where you've got set up for those. Um, a new one also on here is the scales. Um, we show the settings, load and save, clear. And again, we've got recent state uh, scales, but because none have been saved, that's greyed out. That will only uh, be active as soon as uh, something is saved or loaded. And the same is the uh, uh, Yoshimi state. Um, again, load, save, recent states. Um, the state information on here is just about the entire setup, um, including all the system setup, um, so you can get an exact duplicate of what the whole condition of, of Yashim is at that particular time. Um, going back to the Yashimi, which uh, you, we, we have an about window, which gives the basic copyright information and also always gives the uh, version number as well. Um, the reason that's showing an M is because it's actually the master version, it's not the last release. Um, we, we always indicate now if, uh, if we're running one that isn't an actual release one. We know what it's based on, but we know it's not actually that, that release because that can cause confusion either. Um, settings, again, we split these out um, to try and separate them into their own um, fairly obvious groupings. Um, oscillator size, internal buffer size, these are all... Um, more or less standard. Some of the names again have changed slightly, but it's um, pretty much the um, uh, the original sort of settings. A um, few little extra ones. Uh, reports. Um, we can either now send them to standard error, or we can send them, as, as I've got here, to a console window. And if I open the reports window there, that's the messages we got at first start up. Um, which can be useful. Um, a new button that's only appeared very recently, this one, hide non-fatal errors. Um, if you've got situations that can, can generate a whole nest of errors that uh, go up right, right down to maybe, say, a, a, a defect in an XML file, you'll end up with about four or five different error messages as it, as it rolls back through the stack to the actual error itself. Well, sometimes that's not actually particularly useful. So you can click on that and you'll only see the last uh, error message in the, in the, in the list. Um, 
Log XML headers, that's another fairly new one. Um, that's so you can actually see the source that the files that you're loading came from. Uh, you can tell whether they're pure Yoshimi files or whether they are uh, uh, Zin and Yoshimi compatible files and which version that they were generated by. So if it was a file that was generated by uh, the original Zin 2.2.1, that will show on there as well, although that actually shows as version 1, I think, if I remember rightly. Um, Jack is now has its own uh, setting. Um, the MIDI source, you can define an actual um, port that it's going to try and find. So if you've got uh, uh, some uh, uh, Jack MIDI uh, thing running, if that's running before you start Yoshimi, uh, Yoshimi will find it and then uh, connect to it. Uh, the server, fairly obvious, whatever ser Jack server is running. And then you've got these two setters preferred. Um, now these are exclusive with ALSA. If you if you unselect that one, the ALSA one will be selected. And again there, if you select that one, the ALSA one will be unselected. Um, and that uh, is not effective immediately. We're hoping to get it so it will be eventually. But at the moment, you've got to uh, restart for that to become effective. But from now on, it's then remembered for every time you restart. And again, we get this, we get exactly the same thing. Um, with the ALSA tab there. Again, you've got the same thing, the set as preferred. And again, um, you can define um, what MIDI uh, input it's looking for when it starts up. You can also directly define the sound card, um, which can be very useful. If you've got multiple sound cards, you can then decide that you want to uh, connect to a specific card. Um, and then you've got the normal sample rates that you'll attempt to connect to. Um, I find normally sample rates, uh, it'll, it'll be quite happy to, uh, with a decent sound card, quite happy to, to go with what uh, selection you've given. Sometimes I don't fully understand it, but sometimes they also will say, no, we're going to have 44.1k, uh, whether you like it or not. And I've... Uh, I'm sure somebody knows why that happens, but I'm afraid I don't at the moment. Um, right, a few uh, other things on this top area. Um, instead of a big panic button, we've now got a, a more discreet stop button there. It behaves in exactly the same way. It's the only red button in the whole of the, of the main screen, so you can't really miss it. Uh, reset, which uh, used to again be on this menu, now has its own button. And it asks you if you want to be sure that you want to reset all dynamic values. And the default is no. Previously, it used to be yes. Well, we, we, we play safe now. We generally have defaults as being no's rather than yeses. Um, mix the panel. Um, previously, you only had that form there. Uh, two columns of eight. Now you can have whatever choice you've got. If you've got a nice deep screen, you might prefer it that way. If you've got a wide screen like this, then that works better and it looks better as well, I think, personally. Uh, if I'm going too fast, just do, do shout. Um, or I've, there's quite a lot which I want to try and cover. Um, if I look at the uh, audio connections here at the moment, You've got left and right, your standard uh, connected. Also, it exposes the uh, track one left and right independent um, outputs as well. It, it always exposes those, although they're not actually connected anywhere. Um, if you pick up, say, channel two, that's still going to left and right, but it's not showing it uh, at all on there. We've got a new entry down here, which is uh, just got main, part, and both. And that determines what outputs it goes to. It, this is specific to Jack. If you've got ALSA as the output, these are all greyed out because they're not relevant. So if I now select part, and you'll see straight away these two, track two individual ones have now appeared. If I had both, it would still go to main as well. But at the moment, with it set to part, it's only going to those... Um, those two outputs. Um, 
However, as a bit of extra insurance, um, if you change your mind and think, well, no, sorry, I don't want that after one going back to Maine, it still leaves those exposed. Now, the reason for that is that you may start up with those exposed, connect something else to it, and if you then no longer use that, you don't want those to suddenly disappear and whatever else that was connected thinks, hang on, where my two inputs just disappeared to? So once they're there, they'll stay there for the rest of the session. If you stop and restart, then of course you're back to square one. Um, the other reason for doing that is that Yashimi can now have 64 parts. If you expose 64 independent outputs all at once, that's a very long list. That's 128 individual outputs, which is not likely to ever, ever be wanted. Um, so that's that aspect. Uh, what else about there? Um, still talking about uh, parts. You'll notice we've also got this now. I'm saying part two, but same part two of 16. Um, we work in uh, uh, four up to four rows of 16 parts now. Um, the, ho the overhead, um, as far as uh, Jack is concerned, is insignificant when you're not actually doing anything. I mean, that's it sitting at the moment. They're sitting uh, DSP load idle around about 0.5, 0.6. If I step that up to 64 parts, you know, that there's very little difference. So that there's no real overhead from that point of view. We are, the only reason we actually have it um, switchable like that is for convenience to avoid confusion and clutter. You don't want it there if, it, if you're not actually using it. You'll notice also when I switch to 64 part, straight away a new window appears there and you can select which row of parts you're looking at. By default, the columns uh, follow the actual channel numbers. So this one is, as you can see, although it's not enabled, it's looking at channel one, that one is channel one, and the same again, right the way through back to the, uh, the, the, the default. Um, if I take that back to 16, that then just disappears. Um, again, a bit of extra insurance. If you've actually used one of these higher sets and then disable it, and then want to save the entire patch set, all, even though they're disabled, those higher ones are still saved. So if you've got your, your most important, wonderful patch on one of those, you don't lose it by having it switched out. It's still there, and it will be saved as part of a patch set. Um, also, a patch set will also uh, uh, save the setting of whether you've got set, say, uh, 16 or 64 parts. So when you reload it, it will re also reset the number of parts available. Um, and that is immediately available. That's not, um, you don't have to re restart for that. Um, right, where's best to go on from there? Uh, I've already mentioned we now have a uh, history capability. Um, so if you uh, use any of these here, you can uh, restore what you last set. So for instance, here in patch sets, if I go recent sets there, the last one I used was crystal ship. And if I reload that straight away, all the patches come in, the volume, panning, settings, everything, and all these are all set exactly as they were last time I used them. Um, and again, to prove that the reset works, reset that and we're back to as we were before. Right, uh, yep. It's resetting um, all the voices. It's resetting the uh, um, uh, master uh, volume, uh, key shift, um, all these controls here, the controllers, they're all reset. Um, in fact, everything except configuration settings are reset. Um, it's, it's, it's a sort of point of amusement. The only thing that doesn't get reset is uh, these going red if you go into, uh, into overload on there. It's the only thing that doesn't get reset. And actually, I thought, well, sod it, I'm going to leave that. Uh, let them see that they've uh, 
that they've gone over the top. Um, right, I think the best thing now to go on is to look at the command line interface, which again is, is fairly new. Um, so if we close that down now, Oh, that's another thing. If you change any settings, it won't automatically save them. It asks you if you want to save them when you exit. Now, because I flicked through some of the settings there, it regarded them as having been changed. Um, so I can either cancel and go back as I was, as if nothing had happened, or I can uh, uh, save or not save the settings. I'm going to decide not to save at the moment. So, um, so we're just closing. Now, if alternatively, I start up from a terminal window, uh, capital K just does the auto connect on the audio. Now, something you might notice is that's come up. That's because we left it up last time. Um, Yoshimi now remembers the state of many of the windows. Uh, this one also, the mixer panel, that came up. Um, the editing windows, like the AdSense engine windows, it remembers their position, but it won't reopen them because you may not have an AdSense part actually operating at that time. So it can't open a window that doesn't actually exist. Um, but if you, if you do then open it, it will reopen it to the last place it was seen at. Um, the same with uh, settings that reopens to where it was last set. It was last set there, so that's where it will reopen to. Um, now, we've tried to implement in the command line a uh, command structure very similar um, to standard read line type format. So if I just type a question mark, then lo and behold, you'll get all the entries in there, which is exactly but that's that's all, all, all the settings there uh, and that's that's quite a fair old list if on the other hand if i close that and in settings send it to standard error save and close and then use the same command again lo and behold we're now paging and we can do the normal type uh, operations. Uh, oops. Uh, can't, can't find the uh, page up and page down ones. On, I'm not sure. Oh, there we are. Oh, no, it's still not. Oh, there we are. So you can do, you can, you can do, So you can go up and down in pages as well as um, individual lines. And it will, uh, well, sorry, I'm used to another key keyboard and it keeps, and everything's in the wrong place here. Anyway, um, we'll just quit from there. And we're back to the uh, command line there. Um, also, uh, oh, are you trying to? Um, yeah, quick question. Is it yeah. going? Yeah, okay. Um, the default for Yoshimi when you give no command and parameters is to enable the command line mode, right? Yeah. And the, the default for the setting is to output the help in the window, not on the console? No, it's, it's to uh, output it to wherever you've decided it should be output. Okay, but the default, if you never used it before. If you've, never used it, if you've never used it before, it will go to Yoshimi's own console window. Yoshimi's own console? Yeah, that's the, the reports window. That would be the wrong thing for a blind person, right? Uh, oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. No, no. You're right. Actually, it does. Yeah, because uh, we changed that a while ago. Okay. Some for specific. Yeah, a, a very first time startup, it will go to uh, the command line. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I, 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 you, actually, you asking that reminded me that we had that same question from a blind person, and we changed it round for them. 
Um, the other thing is um, you can also uh, uh, list various states. So um, I can list the roots, and that's listed however the bank routes that I've actually got set up, which gives their actual full path. Um, I can list the banks. And that's all the banks that are in there. And you'll notice they have these ID numbers. Um, because within Yoshimi, you, you will always refer to them by the ID number, not by the name. Um, the reason for that is that you can change the ID numbers of any of them without actually changing the file system at all. And you can then effectively regroup them um, from within here and from within the, the bank window that Yoshimi supports for, for the GUI as well. Um, again, we've got the uh, um, uh, read line type holding on there. And uh, along with that one, the obvious one is also to list the instruments. And that lists the instruments that are in the current bank. And again, does the, uh, the instruments you'll have there. Um, now, you notice that time I actually didn't put the full name and I, put, I just put INST. One thing we put a lot of effort into here, again, because this is aimed at people that are going to want to be doing a lot of, uh, uh, as little typing as possible, as much as often, is we have a set of um, abbreviations where the most common commands are, have the minimum possible ab abbreviations. So, for instance, those same commands I, I uh, did before, I could have done quite simply like that. And I've listed the banks. Um, and again, the same with the roots. And there they are. Um, and these directly align with there, those are the instruments, those are the banks, and those are the roots. So those are exactly the same things. Um, if I do, that is now listed the current setup on there. And if you look there, you'll find current root ID is nine. The current root ID is nine is highlighted on there. And it'll say the, uh, where are we? Current bank ID is 105. So if I look for the banks, we'll find, lo and behold, 105 is the highlighted current bank. Um, we don't uh, uh, identify a current instrument because that's, that's not really uh, a relevant setting. But all these other settings are here, master volume, master key shift, all the information, the basic information that you might want to know is there including where the reports are sent. Now, because this is aimed at, again, blind people, if you've got reports sent to um, the uh, reports window, you'll still get a message here to say that it's sent there. So you won't just get nothing showing on here. You'll, you'll actually be aware that you've actually got it set the wrong way, as it were. So if I now... Well, actually, I'll do it from here. Um, Uh, I'm trying to remember what I... Uh, I, can't, I, don't know, I can't remember what the command is now. <laughs> Typical. Um, Oh, it is a G. Yeah. Uh, also, in this uh, in this help menu, um, all your minor ab abbreviations are indicated by the capitals. So, for instance, if you ever use the, the scale, it's SC that you have to put in. Set minimum abbreviation is S. Reports, it's REP. Um, the reason for that having to be REP is you're going to get roots being used as a single R and and so on. And in this case, to if I now um, 
exit that. And if I do right, reports are now sent to the console window, and you'll see there sending reports to console window there. But any command you send here, it'll it'll tell you that it's not sending it here anymore. It's sending it to the to the console window. Uh, a quick get out of that is just, and that sets you back your default conditions, which is sending reports to standard errors and showing all errors. Remember, I mentioned before about hiding the uh, um, non-fatal system uh, errors. Um, they are now being shown again. Probably the most used command of all is going to be the set command. Um, so in, in that case, again, it's a minimum abbreviation. Uh, and the way you set things, uh, you can actually daisy chain commands. So I can do SP4, F type. Right. Now, what I've done there in one move is I've set part four in the. Um, um, in, a, uh, in, a, in a terminal window, but it actually sets part five in the GUI. Um, this is because all the numbering here all starts from zero. We don't have this mixture of zeros and one starting numbers that, that, that the GUI has. Uh, again, this was at, at the suggestion of someone that uses um, terminals exclusively. He, 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 he hates this business where some things start from one and others start from zero. So we thought, well, these are the people we're aimed at, we'll, we'll, we'll orientate it in their favour. Um, but at the same time, it set the uh, uh, default, the first FX number as being reverb and the first um, effect preset. Now, if I enable that so we can actually see it, if I edit that and look at the effects, you'll find, lo and behold, it has set the reverb one. Again, this comes up as one on the GUI, but it is zero on the, um, uh, on the um, command line. Um, currently, the part effects uh, don't directly update when you change the uh, um, command line. They don't change it in their GUI. Uh, that's something that we're working on. The system and insertion effects do change immediately, but it's just specifically the part ones that don't. They are correct. If you just switch from one part to another, you will then see the correct one. So if I set uh, the... Um, Uh, let me think. Uh, set preset three. Um, it set it to there, but it, as I say, it hasn't shown it there. Um, if I just uh, switch backwards and forwards and come up to again, then you'll see that it has actually set it. As I say it's something which which we need we need to. Uh, um, get operational, um, but it has actually set the effect. Um, you might also notice that I didn't do the whole business about the part, effects, and all the rest of it. I just went straight to the preset number. Um, the command line remembers various different uh, um, levels that, it, that you've actually reached at. It's now on the effects level, so you only actually operate um, all the commands you do now are referring to effects. The effect number, um, the effect type and the preset. If you want to get back to, say, the part menu, you then just do that. And that steps back one. We're now on part level, and everything do, we do now refers, uh, refers to, to parts. So if I want to change the part volume, I just do set V, say, 40, and you'll find, lo and behold, it should have set that. Oh, was. I forgot to do the space. Um, and there, it set the volume. Um, spaces are critical on here. Um, you, you actually, you must have them. There are, there are almost no commands that can be stacked directly because they all need parameters. 
but they'll also take default parameters, so you can, just leaving a space, will give you your default parameter, or the last used one. So for instance here, the last used part number was four, so I set the volume of four. But what I can do if I want to, I say, well, I don't want to work on four, I now want to work on three, and I want to change the padding. So I go S3, P, 20, and now, lo and behold, it set the panning of part number three without even enabling it and without uh, having to go, step back and forward again. Because we're at part level, it directly changed to part three when I gave it a number. That's all I have to do. If I go S1 like that, it'll straight away, it'll change to, well, part two of the GUI, but part, two, two as, uh, part one as far as this is concerned. It also, as you'll see here, the responses, it always tells you what level it's at and what number it's on or what effect it's on and all the rest of it. Um, and as we develop it, um, this will, everything that we do will, will always reflect back on, um, on where you actually are in the system. So you'll always know. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure. Is there any questions about that, that whole area? It, it does get very confusing at first, but once you get familiar with it, it, it is actually very, very quick and easy to use. Anyone? No? Nope. Right, moving swiftly on then. Um, my uh, particular hobby horse uh, was some time ago, uh, about three years ago I think now, just a matter of curiosity, I thought, I well, wonder what happened if you set more than 16 parts. Um, so I set it up to run at 32 parts, and lo and behold, with very little changes, I could actually do it, and I could actually see 32 parts. I couldn't do a lot with them, because um, the ones from 16 onwards were just uh, virtually exact duplicates of, of the lower ones, because I had no way of, of making any sort of particular direct controls of it. But it did open the way for me for something which I'd wanted to do for a long time, which was vector control. Uh, and vector control, I don't know if any of you remember the old Yamaha series, that had the joystick uh, button on them, which you could then change between four parts. You had an X and a Y axis, and you could then uh, mix across. And this was just a simple basic volume mix. You, you faded one up and another one down. And I thought, well, hang on, if we can have uh, multiple parts, not just the 16 ones, um, and, they, and we can have them in groups of four all on the same channel, then lo and behold, this is the way in for vector control. And so um, I initially started doing it, uh, I think it was November before last. Um, and the last LAC I was actually showing in its most basic form, it was, it was usable um, using NRPNs to do the actual setting up. Well, now we've come further than that. Uh, now we can do it, uh, set it up much more easily from the command line. Um, and also, whereas previously the only controls we had were volume and pan, we can now do um, up to four uh, different features, if we call them, um, and they can be together or they can be separate. So, you, so on the x-axis, you could have volume and panning being controlled, and the y-axis, you could have filter cutoff and modulation being controlled or you could swap them around, or you could have them going in the reverse direction. So you could have the volume going up with the control setting, but the pan is shifting from right to left instead of from left to right. Um, and the final um, uh, step in that is now you can actually redefine three out of those four features to any um, uh, CC that Yoshimi will recognize. Um, at the moment, that's not terribly useful because there aren't very many of them that are available. But looking towards the future is that when we eventually can get um, uh, MIDI Learn operational, then that means any control that you can uh, set could then be put on vector control as well. So it could be a, an, an individual fil filter for uh, maybe one, um, uh, one voice in AdSense or it could be whatever. 
Thank you. So there's a question from IRC from Fundamental, which is, which users is this command line interface targeted at? Command line itself is mostly targeted at blind users or people with site difficulties or people that want to control Yashimi other than via a GUI. Um, and that can be by using NRPNs or it can be using any form of TTY that can link into the command line. So it's uh, quite quite wide ranging. Um, still on on ve vector control. Um, if I set one up now, I'm actually I actually run through uh, TTY MIDI to do it because I've got my own little uh, do dodgy bit of ele electronics there that uh, to control it. Um, so we'll connect that up because we always forget to do that, don't we? connect that and I'll see again the command line has just reported that it's now seen a MIDI thing. Um, the first thing to do which nine times out of ten uh, you're going to forget the first time you use this is if you haven't got the number of parts available set then you won't be able to use vector control and it'll very quite politely tell you that you haven't got enough parts. So the first thing I'm going to do is set the available parts to 64. It would work, only one thing. Uh, anyone spot my deliberate mistake? I'm still at part level. So it's expecting to see a part command. Um, to go back to the um, top level, it's simply that. And that could have been on the front of a command. You can put that on, on the front of any command, and it'll go right back to the top level to operate. So we'll now try that again. And again, we've got the full reline history coming up here, so I just step back a couple of steps and straight away I've now got, and you'll see this is reflected, it now has 64 parts available. Uh, the other thing is, it always pays to know which actual root and bank you're in. So what I'll do now is set the root to 9, and it's just done so, and it's told me what it is I've actually just set. And I'll set the B bank to, uh, I can't remember, 110. And now that's the bank of instruments we got. So we know where we are exactly. Again, because it, uh, it uses defaults where it can, um, if I just do hang on, set vector CC, this is the incoming. Um, controller value that's going to be the x-axis controller. So CC14, which is, an un, which is an unused CC by default, so it's available for us to play about with. And again, it tells me exactly what it's done. Because I didn't specify any particular channel, it's assumed the default one, which is channel 0 or channel 1 on the GUI. Um, and now... If I set the features for that one, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set volume for that. SF1. Oh. Uh, where's it gone? It's, and again, it's reported that, that that's exactly what it's done. Um, and what I can now do is set the programs for that. And because it's the x-axis, we're going to set the programs for the left side and the right side. Um, now, that, again, it's not probably terribly clear. Um, the left side is going to be the voice which will be most effective if the joystick is towards that direction. Right is obviously the other one. And as it happens, the left one is going to be... Um, part number one, the right one will be, uh, sorry, part number zero, the right one will be part number 16. So if I now uh, set PR which for program, L20, and that's set that part, it tells me which part is actually set. And if I do the same for the right, and for that, I'm going to set 120. 
and lo and behold, it's set that part there. I now switch to the Y axis and I go and we're going to use CC15 for that, for that ch channel, because again, it's one that we know that we can use, it's unused. And for features on that one, I'm going to set for panning. So I'll set F2, which is the default um, feature number two, the default is panning. Um, and we enable it, otherwise it won't do anything at all. If you don't set features, it's not going to do very much. It's just going to sit there sulking when you try and operate it. And then again, we set the uh, the, the actual um, voices we, we want to use in that. So for there, uh, and this time it's up and down. We're on the y-axis, so it's up and down, not left and right. Um, 78, and that's that voice now uh, tied onto there. And if I now do the down direction, and we'll set that to 107. Right, and that now, if I now do uh, list vectors, it tells me on channel naught I've got X uh, CC set to 14, and features are pointed to 1 and Y. A, the um, features are pointed to two. And if I now twiddle that, and straight away you can see that um, it's having some effect. We've got that on part two, so it's not actually going to show anything. If I move that up to 48, uh, 33 to 48, you'll see that while I'm varying the volume on that one, on the x-axis, on the y-axis, I'm varying the pan on that one. And if we've got everything connected, which we don't appear to have, uh, and this is the sort of effect you can get. You see, you're getting the left and I don't know if you can actually detect the left and the right shifts on there as well as the uh, so you've got real control over those features but that is what vector control gives you now very recently we added something else to this we can now save that so we can save that, and all I do, um, if you don't put a full path, it'll save to whatever the current directory is. So I can just put, uh, oh, might help us if I was back in the command line. Oh. So I can now just put um, save vector, and we'll call it uh, new sound. Oh new sound um, and it will also automatically put an extension on that it'll it'll call it uh, x x v y uh, as an extension um, and if you load it, it it'll look for that if it doesn't find it it will still load it but it won't be very happy um, so there's there's your first save one um, it's not only saved in there it's also saved in settings and it'll be saved um, it, um, uh, along with any any other data in your, in your patch sets and such like as well. Um, so that, I think, is just about it as far as vector control is concerned. Oh, another thing. I saved it there. It saved whatever was on the current part that I was working on. The current part was part zero because I was working on, on part zero. It saves the part that it was loaded, that it was saved from, as well as the actual data. So if you just do a reload, it will reload to the same part. But you can, act, you can actually tell it, sorry, the same channel. You can actually tell it to reload to a different channel. So if I do um, uh, that, what did I call it? New sound. Um, if I now say CH5... 
new sound. And there, what low there it is, yeah. Um, and that's exactly the same setting as we had before. And it'll also very kind, be very kind to you. If you haven't got the right number of parts set, it'll actually set those as well. Um, if you'd only wanted to use one axis, just the x-axis, you could have used it with just 32 parts, and it would have set that up as well. Um, now that's, that's actually, once I did that, I thought, well, hang on, what, is there anything else that we can use these um, 64 parts for? And I did come up with something else, um, which is a little bit peculiar, but I've actually produced a representation of it using the normal channel, so you can see exactly what it does. Because there's lots of extra controls that we've added. Um, you can now um, effectively dis disable a channel by setting its uh, channel, uh, uh, sorry, disable a part by setting its channel number to the normal number plus 16. Um, so if I, let's stop that and do a complete reset. Again, you can do the reset from the command line as well if you want to. Um, From the GUI, all you can do is you can change to those channels. From the terminal, I can set that. Uh, go back to S. Oh, hang on, I'm still going to be on part four. S P zero. Right. Now that has effectively disabled that without actually changing anything about it. It'll no longer receive MIDI commands. Um, but whatever sound might be set there is still available. So you think, well, what's the use of that? Uh, you know, how, how can that uh, be of use? And the way it can be used, uh, I did sort of briefly refer to last year at the LAC. If I take that back to the normal channel one, and, oh, I've... Yeah, yeah, disconnected, yeah. Let's reconnect that again. Okay. Now, I've got to try and manage this. Right. It still responded to the key off but it won't respond to any further keys. However, if instead of that, if we go back to, to zero, and if this time I set it to 32, right, look, no hands. I've now got a drone going there, which will remain there until such time as I re-enable it and then get, give it a note off, or we do a, a stop or anything like that. So you can use that to set up a drone, and then you can actually then say, well, okay, I still want to be able to use that channel. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, so I'm going to go to 32 parts, and I use part 17, I'm going to enable it, and I'm going to have that on there. And I've still got that drone going. And I've still got part zero available for something else, which might be related. It might be something completely different. Um, but we'll, we'll stop that now, because after a while it gets a bit boring. So that's another thing you can start to do with it. And it gets, it gets better. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'll stop that from there and go back to a normal GUI start. And... Um, Will? Yeah? Another question. Um, okay, so first thing, um, you now set up the vector controls on the command line, but setting it up on the GUI would also work, right? Um, no, you can set the programs from the, GUI, from the GUI, but you can't set the vector itself up. You can set it okay. via NRPN. I've yet to work out an ideal way of getting an extra window to do a complete vector control from within, um, from within the GUI itself. I want to do it, but it's, it's not a high priority. Okay. 
Um, ironically, the people that have shown most interest in vector control are both blind, mm -hmm. uh, which is just pure chance. I, was, I never expected that, but uh, two of them, and they, they, they think it's great, which is wonderful. I mean, uh, even if they're the only two people in the world that are using it, that's, uh, you know, it's, it's nice to know. Um, but I, w I say, eventually I will uh, produce a, a GUI access to it and, and possibly actually show the, the, the position of the, of the controls as well, which at the moment you, uh, you're guessing, basically. If, if it's not volume and pan, you can't see what they are. Um, anyway. Sorry, two, two follow-up questions still. <laughs> All right, two for the price yeah, of one, eh? Yeah. I'm getting glutton. Um, first is you set up uh, for X and Y, so you had four patches between you could uh, vector around. Yeah. Uh, in your demo, I only heard two sounds. So, did you only use one of the two controllers? You only used no. There were four sounds going there. Okay, then I didn't hear it. The, yeah, the four sounds. Uh, two of them were being swept left and right, and the other two were being uh, volume controlled up and down. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, uh, the two that were swinging left to right uh, was one was had a um, uh, modulation on it, mm -hmm. uh, and the two that uh, were being uh, swept up and down. One was a very a rich pad and the other one was a much sharper um, morphing sound. Okay. But, um, uh, yeah, they were, they were there, but they were all four there. Okay, so uh, those were two dimensions. Is there any technical limitation to have N dimensions also? Two dimensions is all you're going to get. <laughs> <laughs> no reason I'm asking. I was just having this, this vision. Um, I'm mm. not an artist, but imagine an artist standing in a 3D room, moving around, his position being detected, and he could sweep through sounds by walking through the room, for instance, in three or more there, 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 Actually, there is a way you could do that, actually. If you set up a second vector on, channel, on the next channel up, that could then be on another pair of, of uh, CCs, incoming CCs. So you could, if you then using four of them, uh, you'd have to, have to use two joysticks for that. Then you would then get a total of eight sounds that you could control on just two channels. Okay. Okay. Thanks. All right. All right. right. If I bring up Rose Garden and I load, that's the one. Right, um, NRPNs can be used to set various uh, things. Like you can set uh, the programs, enable them, and, and all the rest of it. Um, that's actually, to us, that's now old hat. We've been able to do that for about three or four years. Um, so what I've got here is I've got a simple setup here. Um, it sets that up. Oops, no, it doesn't. And it doesn't because we're on the wrong patch set. Uh, hang on, let's go. Yeah. Uh, while we're on this, we've got multiple ways of getting to, to banks, uh, instruments, and routes. We could go there, or we can pick it up through there. Yeah, uh, yeah. We can get to the instruments from there. We can get to the instruments from there as well. If we, if we weren't there, we could go from there. Um, we can also get to the instruments from there as well. So, I mean, there's multiple routes to actually get to those places. So, a beginner's question, maybe I missed something. What do the colors represent in this view? Right. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I do what I... No, I that's, that's good. That's a, that's a good... You see, the thing is, I'm so familiar with these, I forget that not everyone knows them. It's really right. pretty, though. <laughs> it, it is, isn't it? Yeah, right. The red indicates that ad synth is being used. The blue indicates that pads... Uh, that, sorry, sub synth is being used. And the um, green one that pads since. Brilliant. Now, when I say it's being used, it's being used somewhere in an entire kit. If you've got a kit of, well, uh, this is actually a good example. Actually, if we, if we load that one up and go to the kit edit, you can see that it's grouped across um, several uh, entries. Um, and the reason we've got that is... It's not just because it looks pretty, it also because it gives you an indication of, of how the, the patch is going to perform. Um, AdSynth is the heaviest one for, for processor usage. Um, pad, uh, SubSynth tends to be relatively light and fairly quick and easy to set up and is uh, very good for sort of noise-based sounds. 
Uh, pad synth is the slowest one to initialize. So if you're running, because you can change parts while you're actually running. If you're um, running a bit low on CPU, you don't want to be starting up an, uh, an instrument that's got a pad synth element because it can be relatively slow. But it is, once it's actually there, it's the one that's the lightest of all on processor usage. So it's useful to know those. They appear here and they appear in what you've actually got. Um, but anyway, I'm now on the correct um, bank. So if I now run that, it should bring that. And it brings that to there. Now, that's a sort of reasonable sort of baseline. It's, um, it's, it's OK. It's, um, it could get a bit monotonous, monotonous after a while. Um, and then you get a sort of a, well, yeah, it's, it's pretty, it's, uh, um, what more can you say about it, really? Right, so if we stop that, I think, well, hang on, uh, I'm not so keen on that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to bring control onto that. Now, remember what I said about switching uh, parts off and on? Right, now you watch these tabs here. These are off. Ah. <laughs> now if you notice these bars, they're all going up and down. There's no sudden cutoffs. You get a nice smooth transition from them all because you're not I'm using the, the Add 16 version, which allows the note off to operate, but no further note on. But because it is a note off, um, you'll get a proper decay, you'll still get the tail end of the note, you'll get whatever reverberation content there is there. If you were switching the parts off and on, you get a sharp stop on that. So this is much kinder. And if I then add the control for the pad sound as well, And I've got a, a ninth one on there. So we've got our changing bass. Again, nice smooth transitions. We just changed um, the settings on there. Um, it's always a problem when you're using kit that you're not familiar with because all sorts of things then switch off and on when you're not expecting it. Right, I should be getting that on channel 9 when I'm not. Uh, why am I not getting it on channel 9? Because I'm not sending it on channel 9 probably. Do, 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 do. If you'll bear with me for a moment, that should. I've got it. All right, try again. And 
again. I say we've got our nice smooth transitions coming in. So you, know, you just play along quite happily. And there you go. You're now a one-man band, quite happily. <laughs> All right, so that's... Now, these are, I've spread out across these eight parts there with a the ninth one for actual playing with. But again, with this business, we're having 64 parts. I would actually put all those four on the one channel, which then would put those on the next channel. So I've then only actually used two incoming channels for this uh, eight-part uh, backing track, um, which then leaves all the remaining uh, ten channels available for anything else I want to add. Um, depending on what voices you actually use is going to affect how many you can, you can stuff on there before the CPU starts complaining about it. But uh, it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a lot that you can sh shove on there, unless you use the, the heavy-duty patches. Uh, right. I think there's there's various things which I've probably missed. Um, oh, I reminded myself to plug in the joystick while well, I remember that this time. Um, oh, yes, yes, there was something else. Uh, in the settings, um, I'm going to stop Rose Garden, and we're now going to see, our, I think, our first X run, because Rose Garden um, always produces X runs when it when it closes down. And there they are, three of them. Um, yeah. uh, I have asked the Rose Garden people to look at that. It's, I think it's probably that it's, that it's um, um, shutting down the jack buffer before it's actually finished um, uh, clearing whatever's in there. Something that's been queried by a number of people is this little feature we have here. Uh, multiple instances. Um, now these in instances are uh, semi-independent. You'll notice this one's produced its keyboard and it's not going anywhere at the moment, which is a shame because it should be. Um, and it's uh, got its own uh, patch settings and all the rest of it. Quite independent of that one. But also, if I look in settings here, it's got its own routing. It's not routing to Jack. It's routing directly to a sound card. And it's routing to the default device, which should be the output from here. And we should be seeing it. We're seeing it as an input in here, but for some reason it's not actually coming out. And it was earlier. I don't know why it, it isn't now. Um, unless we are not possibly monitoring it. Yeah, we're not, we weren't monitoring it. Um, I'm actually looping through into the um, um, KA6 here, which is why the volume is very low, because I've not got anything like the right sort of levels for it. But um, it do, is just proving the point that you can actually have uh, multiple sound cards and multiple instances of Yoshimi can then be directed to individual sound cards, um, which again gives you effectively more capability. Um, and the input can be uh, Alsa as, as it is here. It could be Jack again. So you could then have um, separate input routes and separate output routes on, as I say, on multiple instances, which can then be summed in the analog realm, um, which just gives you that much more capability. Also, it means if you've got a multi-core processor, um, then it's going to spread the load between the cores a bit more evenly, hopefully. Um, how true that's going to be, I don't know, but the theory is there that it should do. Um, it won't be of any benefit at all if you've only got a single core. Um, right, any, any, any questions on any of that? 
Right. Oh. I'm not sure if that's good news or bad news, actually. Or maybe you're just explaining it to us. <laughs> um, the other thing is, again, because these have their own settings, um, you'll notice this came up already to a set of um, conditions um, because I'd actually saved it previously. Um, so there again, um, you, you can have a, a default setup where you just load it up and you can also specify a particular instance that you want to bring up. So not just that, that, the first available one, you can say I specifically want instance number, well you can't bring up zero again because it's already up. Um, but I could say, uh, for instance, I could uh, have uh, instant, instance two, which I haven't used before, and Yoshimi instance two will come up to what are they, whatever the default settings are, which I can't remember offhand. We'll have a look, see what they are. Right, and it's going to have an... In, that's another thing. It can have a inter, different internal buffer size to the... Uh, uh, first one, and it can have a different oscillator size if you want it. I can't think of any practical reason for wanting that, but you can actually have them if you want them. But this one has come up uh, as to, to Jack as the preferred MIDI and the preferred audio. Um, so if I were to go through the virtual keyboard on there, there it is, it's, it's come straight through. And if I had a Jack, anything sending Jack MIDI, it would come through to there, or you could pick it up from there if you wanted to. Um, and again, because it's a new instance, it's got no save data, it wants to know if I want to save it or not. I'm not going to because I don't particularly want it. But uh, And it would have its own history files as well. We are going to combine some of these files because some of them is unnecessary duplication. You don't need a different bank set for another instance. And it can actually get confusing if they had different sets. At the moment, they are independent, but we will com be combining those. But things that are actually specific to the instance will always remain separate. Um, which actually brings me on to another point. The original uh, config file, um, because we kept on adding bits to it, grew and grew, uh, as I say, like Topsy, uh, until it was coming quite unmanageable. So we've now split it up. And we split it up into... Where are we? a number of different files. And if I go to the config, where are we? Config, Ishimi. Right. We have a, a, a default presets directory, so your presets will want to go there by default. You don't have to use that, but they will, they will be there by default. I've got none set, so there's none there. Um, You've got the original banks, uh, one for the first version. You've got one for the uh, other one that I brought up. And then we've now got one for um, that um, a second instance, which I, I brought up briefly. We've got history files there. And they've also got the window files as well. The window files are very, very basic because we still don't know entirely what we're going to do with it. It's just straightforward text giving the uh, the uh, window name and its uh, uh, the, uh, uh, location and, and whether it's to be restarted or not. Um, the rest are XML files. Uh, because the config is now so... Ooh. Because the config is now so changed from um, uh, Zinad Sub, we no longer give it a, a Zinad Sub um, uh, file type. It's now uh, it's now a Shimi one. Um, so it now gives a doc type of Yashimi data rather than um, uh, Zinad. Um, we thought we should do that as only fair because it, it is not that particular file is no longer compatible with Zin. Uh, and there's no reason why it should be. There's no reason why it should be compatible with anyone else that's running Yashimi because not, no two people are going to run exactly the same configuration setups. So why would it? Uh, why would you want to have that uh, compatible in that sense? Um, history files, it's going to store whatever information, uh, whatever uh, things were loaded and saved. Nothing has been uh, loaded and saved except that 
there, so therefore there's nothing except that in there. Um, but uh, anyway, that uh, is just about it for that. Um, Right, there's one other thing which I thought might be uh, interesting to look at, which again is a rose garden thingy. Um, at one time, this particular um, program here had to run with two instances of Yoshimi. Um, this was because it, it uses 32 different voices. I could now do this using one instance. Like, there's several ways I could do it. I could either set 32 parts and use the switching of the um, uh, channels to get the effect I wanted. But when I first produced this, that feature wasn't available. So my only way of doing it was actually uh, switching parts off and on. Uh, which meant I had to be far more careful because I had to make sure that they weren't being switched at a time when they were actually sounding. Uh, but it does actually prove something because it will actually switch them. If I reset that, it will, it will uh, actually switch them while other tracks are sounding. And um, it should do so without making any um, clicks or bumps or anything like that. And it should also do so without producing the X runs. Now, if we just remember, we had three there from Rose Garden, so those three are still there. I should better run that through. And it's loading in parts as it needs them. And it's setting, uh, it should be setting their volumes there. I've just set a volume there as it, as it loaded it. Now, we've been able to do this for quite some time now. But the only thing that what used to be a problem was loading a part on top of another part. Loading a part on the basic simple sound wasn't a problem. But if you loaded a part on top of another one, you uh, sometimes got funny buzzes and, and crackles and that. You didn't get an extra one, but you just got some funny sounds. Whereas now that, that no longer happens uh, because we've changed the way um, parts are muted in between uh, uh, Part changes and we've also changed the way program loading is handled as well and if I bring up the uh, if you do a right click on any of these it closes one as it opens the other if you do a left click it just opens it up straight now it did actually select that root path Now we should see fairly soon, we should see it change, change bank. There we are. Just changed the drums and brought in a drum kit. You can see there. These days it does this upside down so you don't have to scroll anymore. Um, whereas previously it did it at the bottom and then you had to keep on scrolling down to see it. But now the most recent change is at the top. See again, we've got the um, bank has changed again. It gets less boring later on. <laughs> I have a question. Um, those events are MIDI events, right? Yes. So you need to send them a little bit before the note. That's right, yeah. Yeah, so, so yeah. it has time to preload. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, we haven't invented time travel. <laughs> now we should find now it's starting to overlap previously used ones. I think the Echo Choir was one.
Yes, that went on to 11, which had previously been used. Oh, 11, sorry, 12 rather, which had previously been used. Again, this gives the command line numbers rather than the uh, um, GUI values. Um, I think it's actually unfortunate that when the MIDI spec was set up, things like banks, uh, MSB and, and LSB, or as we use them, banks and routes, started from zero. But things like program changes started from one, which, I mean, it just throws everybody. And channel numbers start from one. Um, so again, we've, um, that one wasn't there. We've um, stuck that on there. And there's, there's you know, we're not seeing any further X runs at all or anything like that. We're not running terribly low on, uh, um, um, on the setup. We're running at uh, uh, one to eight frames. So, I mean, that's giving us five milliseconds. Um, I have had this on my uh, door at home running at 16 frames at 48K, um, which is not bad. Uh, well, it's, it's a bit insane, really, because it's less than a millisecond. Um, And the reason I chose this particular tune for this is quite a lot of these, I mean, like that master synth there, that's one of my heaviest patches going. And if that can work through that while that's sounding, then I don't think we're going far wrong. Um, this ghost choir, again, it's quite demanding because it's got a very long uh, decay uh, on it. And... Um, while Yoshimi has a decay in operation, you, it can't produce any further notes. It can't replace that note as such. It's still going to be doing processing on it. Should get. Uh, I think there's another couple of changes, another overwriting changes. We've got far read in there. I see already. Um, oh, I'm trying to remember which one we've yet to come up. Oh yes, it's rushes, which is our oh, Voyager. That's the one I was thinking of. It's going to produce the background pattern on here. And that's a, a simple substance sound. It's actually very effective. Just, uh, we, I'm using these to produce a sort of extra noise content to it, which is, uh, um, I would say of the uh, voices available, uh, Substance is my favourite, actually. If you know, if, if you're allowed to have favourites. And the clarinet has now come in now as well. Again, that's overwritten another voice. I mean, uh, I can't remember which one. One of them gets overwritten about four times. Um, which again suggests that we're, we're doing something right with the way the, the patches are being loaded. And again, we've, in here, we've got, ever since I actually switched to that, we've got the full history of what we've, we've done. Uh, one suggestion I was asked about whether it's possible was to actually save this information, this form. Uh, I don't know if there's actually any need for it, um, but it could be if it, if it was wanted. But uh, I can't personally think of any reason why anyone would want to do that because all the information is in the source file anyway, the you know, MIDI file. So why would you want to effectively uh, duplicate it? And there was a nice little fade down on there as well. Um, so there you go. Um, that is Yoshimi.
And again, we're still at those same three X runs that we had when we closed Rose Garden last time. And if I close Rose Garden now, we'll get some more X runs. And lo and behold, there we are. There's a few more. Um, I don't think there's much more I can say about it. Um, I uh, will just uh, just talk to to Rui about this. Um, if you open the the edit, uh, click the edit button of your patch, yeah. and then open the sub synth edit window. Yeah. Why is this a sub synth, not an add synth? Was it was it wrong? Or, I mean, this is our edit. Yeah, blame it blame it on 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 Paul Nasker. It was always like this. Uh, it was always like that, yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, well, that's actually something I forgot to mention since last time. It's actually saying it's sub-synth on part seven and it's Voyager. <laughs> so that information is there now. And also, if I bring up, a, if I enable add synth on there, um, yeah, it's just... you'll get the voice premises and it will say it's now an add synth voice rather than the add synth main part. And if I go on to that element, it'll also tell you that it's oscillator one that we're looking at. So you know which oscillator of which part, and it's add synth there. And we get a similar thing with the pad synth. Uh, this will show that it's the pad synth oscillator. Uh, you only get one of those, uh, but nevertheless, it'll tell you which one it is. Um, I don't know why Paul called subsynth subsynth, because it's... Well, it is and it isn't really. What you're doing is you're taking white noise and taking everything away except the ones that you're allowing through. So would you call that add or sub? I, I don't know. I, um, it, it is what it is, basically. Intuitively, I'm, I'm tweaking up um, harmonics, I guess. Yeah, that's, that's it. That's for me additive, not subtractive. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah, I, I would agree with you to some degree. At all, um, but at the same time, what, if you're going to call that an ad synth, what are you going to call ad synth? Um, okay, it's it's what we've got. It's it, it's it's what we live with. Um, actually, while while we're on this, I I, I think I'm in, I, I don't know how far I went into this last year. Let's clear all this, reset everything, go back to square one. Um, Oh, we can also edit from there. I forgot that. That's another thing you can do. If you do a right click on there, it will actually bring up the edit window. Um, almost everything you might want to do, you can do from several different routes. And I've just realized something else which I forgot to mention is this little fe fella here, Humanize. That does a very small randomization, but it does randomization across the entire part. That's all engines. And, and all kits. So it's not just one part, it's the, the whole of that part is going to be subject to that randomization. And that again will be saved um, with, a, with a patch set. It won't be saved in a voice because it's not a voice element, it's a patch set element. So the, the patch set will save that setting as well. But anyway, we were talking about subsynth. Um, I probably haven't got that anymore. And well, let's go back to using the virtual keyboard for a moment. Uh, standard substance sound, slightly sort of phasey sort of sound. Increase the bandwidth, it's quite obviously noise, because that's all it is, it's a band of noise. And if you bring up another harmonic, you know that? Again, it's bands of noise. Um, and that is what people tend to lose sight of. The other thing is that it's the, the levels um, are not fixed levels in the sense that the, the whole thing is normalized. The level of that is relative to the overall level, which is basically being, at the moment being defined by that. If I pull that down, then it's mostly that that you're hearing. Um, uh, actually, if I if I do link back onto the keyboard again, uh, where are they? Oh. Right, if I bring that down. Bring 
set up a game. Now that actually, that see that uh, part four is now actually that harmonic number four is quite quiet comparatively. If I bring that down, the number four is getting louder. So it is a re relationship between the, the, the various levels. Um, because as I was saying uh, earlier, this is why you can't readily give these numbers. They, they wouldn't mean anything. Um, because you'd only have to be able to uh, class them as a percentage of the, of the total output, whatever that happens to be. It's, it's a really weird thing. It takes a while getting your head around it. I'm not even sure that I've done so myself. Uh, uh, um, all right. Any any other questions at all? Uh, this is not related to Yoshimi, but just a small note. Um, I saw you had running TTE MIDI. Mm -hmm. um, I made a fork for it, a fork of it for mod mm -hmm. to make it work with Jack MIDI instead of also MIDI. Mm -hmm. uh, you might want to try it if you want. Yes, yes, I'd be interested in that. Yeah, yeah it's um, mm. on GitHub mod devices slash mod dash TT mm. MIDI. Right, yeah. And then I'll look for it. Yeah. yeah, it it connects with. Well, you have to get your user uh, mm. with permissions. Yeah. To read. Yeah. And okay. Yeah. It has to be the same user that runs Jack. Yeah. But if that mm. is working for you, then uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, yeah. yeah. Uh, one thing I, 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 I'm going to put my hand up and say um, straight away is uh, we handle Alta MIDI better than we handle Jack MIDI at the moment. Um, I know that and I know the reason why and we are working on it. But it's, it's again, it's like everything else, it's priorities. What do you do first? Um, and my personal priority at the moment is the command line. Um, that's, that's the one I'm concentrating on most. Uh, All right. No, no more. Huh? Oh. Mm -hmm.